Um, my name's Julie Warm, and I'm the one who uh, sends you all the emails. Thank you for joining the uh, our February program. We're pretty excited about it. Uh, just to give you a heads up, we have some other things on the calendar. Uh, and uh, March 15th, now all these times are in Central. We're going to have a networking meeting. Now, the networking meeting, I know this is really weird, but it's not Zoom. It's this uh, thing called Como Space. And uh, you just hang out like it was a regular reception. So stay for half an hour, stay for an hour, stay for 10 minutes, and then bop out. Um, we just kind of stand around and virtually and talk. Um, no programming, just kind of hang out. The next one is in April, April 25th, again, 1.30 Central on micro-credentialing. People are really pumped about that one. Uh, mm -hmm. And then May 10th at one o'clock, alumni support. I'm going to turn it over to our president, Jonathan, to introduce our speakers. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jonathan Lidris. I'm the president of the Midwest Inclusive Post-Secondary Alliance, or MIPSA, uh, one of the regional alliances of uh, around 10 states uh, in the Midwest. And um, today, uh, and it's really exciting, we're going to be talking about uh, vo vocational rehabilitation and the relationship with inclusive post-secondary programs uh, across the United States. And we have two amazing presenters today to really kind of uh, help us through this. Um, uh, I want to introduce Susanna miller Rains uh, and uh, Russ Thielen. Both of them uh, can really help guide everybody and answer some questions through uh, our journey here as inclusive post-secondary programs and our relationships with vocational re rehabilitation or VR. So I'm going to pass it off to our presenters. Thanks so much. Glad to be here today. Um, I'm Susanna and I'm currently the coordinator of the Georgia Inclusive Post-Secondary Education Consortium. So I have worked with VR for a number of years on behalf of all of our IPSE programs in Georgia. I'm also the chair of the Southeast Post-Secondary Ed Alliance. And those things are not going to be happening much longer in my life because I'm now going to work for the Think College Network to help support more regional alliances and state alliances. And I get to do this work continually. So um, I'll let Russ say a little bit more about who he is. Sure, thanks, Susanna. And, and uh, you know, welcome to Think College. <laughs> uh, Susanna and I have worked together for, well, as long as I've worked uh, in the Think College arena. And so it's a pleasure to present with her. And, and uh, just to give you a little bit of background about me, um, I'm at the University of uh, uh, Massachusetts, Boston, in the Institute for Community Inclusion there. I wear a number of different hats, one of which is doing some work um, with Think College. Um, I am referred to, thanks to Susanna, as the re VR dude within Think College. I have a vocational rehabilitation background of about 32 years, um, in fact, just shy of 32 years. And I've, you name it, in a VR agency, I've probably done it. I was a rehabilitation counselor. I was a supervisor. I was a district and regional director. And, and prior to, to making the move to the ICI, uh, was the um, executive director of the Utah Vocational Rehabilitation Program. So um, that's my background. Susanna, do you want me to put the PowerPoint yeah, up at this go. point? Yeah, let's go. Okay, we're ready to rock and roll. So the real thing that we're going to be talking about today is relationships. Um, that is how pretty much anything gets done in this arena um, in the work that we do, whether it's building relationships within our colleges and universities, within our states, within our regions, um, nationally, and then relationships between programs and states with different entities. So today we're going to be talking about the relationship between IPSC programs and vocational rehabilitation. Um, this is a picture of Russ and I um, and oh. our excitement Sorry, about too quick. building positive relationships with people. <laughs> 
Sorry, Susanna. <laughs> it's all good. So we're going to start in the beginning in Georgia. Um, and I'm just going to give you kind of a quick roadmap of the options that we've, we've, we've gone through a lot of options and a lot of roller coasters. And I'm just going to kind of give you the, the things that are possible, the things that could be possible, um, other ideas and some, some learning moments. So um, in the beginning, so I started this um, 10 years ago. So I've been doing this work for 10 years in one week. And in the beginning, um, our, we had one IPSC program in Georgia and my job was to help grow more. Um, but working with our first IPSC program, they began to work with VR one-on-one um, -on -one, um, and they decided that they wanted, and VR wanted them to be a VR provider. Um, so we started out with KSU being a provider and being paid to provide a menu of services depending on what each individual student um, needed um, when it came to um, their VR determinations. So that's where we all started with VR and IPSE. Next. We had a great relationship with VR. Um, we were doing a lot of really great things. Um, we'll say that this is me and um, my colleague at VR. Um, who her and I met um, at a transition conference. And Tangi and I entered into this world of, we're gonna make this partnership work and think about how we can expand VR supports for students in IPSE, especially as we have new programs coming on board. Um, we can start to think about how we can systematize this um, and not make it so just individual school specific. So 2012 to 2015, um, Tangie and I are working closely to try to figure all this out. Next slide, please. So in 2015, we've done a whole lot of work. Um, we've had a great relationship with several people at VR and we got a VR policy put into place. So this VR policy said that VR could authorize and assist CTP. So you had to be a CTP in order for this to, to happen, but um, for qualified students, VR could pay for tuition, um, required fees, books, supplies, um, housing and meals as appropriate based upon a means test. And so it wasn't 100% for 100% of students. It was for students that VR saw this as a, um, a goal and that um, means testing is just a sliding scale based upon family income. Um, and so this was a really awesome accomplishment. We were ahead of the curve on IPSE and VR. Um, we were rocking and rolling and there were a lot of really awesome things going on. Um, it was a really, it, the bureaucracy behind the scenes to get people paid and get those things done. It was a little difficult, um, to get VR to send the checks to the right places and schools and things like that. But we worked out, we had a lot of little things that we worked out, but this was a really amazing policy and we we're very proud of it. Next slide. So we continue to grow opportunities. We have, um, so we have a leadership team in Georgia that's made up of all of our state agencies and all of our IPSE programs. And so at this point um, in the 2016, 2015 arena, we had a really progressive director of special ed at our Department of Education. She had an idea um, to work with um, our VR and do an interagency transfer because um, for those of you who don't know, um, for certain things, VR can use state funds and draw down four times the federal funds. Um, and so there's a, a four to one match and um, to help provide services to, to people in states. And so Georgia was way behind on their max match. And so we were helping VR maximize their matches um, and thinking about ways we could help. So the Department of Ed had this very long standing line item to pay for teachers and institutions. Well, kids haven't been being taught in institutions in a really long time, but when it comes to state budgets and state things, it might cause way more unintentional consequences to try to remove something um, than just to leave it and let it roll. Russ, oh, you went off mute, so. Um, oh, can we go back one slide? 
Go back. Sorry, I wasn't. Yeah, oh, sorry. I thought that was my cue to move forward. Sorry. No, sorry. Um, so this interagency transfer was used for teachers. Um, it was used for IPSC teachers and in institutions of higher education. And um, so we were lucky to be able to help staff the programs to create more of a sustainable model. So we had seven teachers spread throughout the state and we had students getting paid tuition and fees um, that were eligible. Okay, now we can go. Well, in 2016, um, when elections happen on the state level, there are new directors um, of state agencies that happen. And we got a new executive director at RVR. Um, and then we got a new director of transition services. Um, we had very strong relationships with the previous executive director and the previous director of transition services um, and when these new people came on board there was no transfer of information no transfer of relationships we were starting cold so it caused a bit of a roller coaster um, especially because the new director of transition services did not look highly upon ipse programs um, he was not a fan and it was a, a really hard transition for us next so silos went up. They're my least favorite thing. Um, I'm a collaborative person, but VR started working in a silo um, and it became more difficult to get support for our students. Next slide. So to go back a couple of steps, um, we were able to secure some federal funding um, and I can talk at a later date about our legislative funding support. Um, but we were able to secure some funding from our state legislature. And so we, our Georgia council received that money and gave it to the schools. Well, in 20, for 2017, 2018, so the decision was made in early 2017, um, late 2016, that this money would get shifted to VR because some very well-meaning um, Senate budget office person thought, hey, if we give $500,000 to VR, then they can quadruple that and we'll have $2.5 million to support IPSC. Great idea, um, but you have to run those things by other people. And when you don't have a really good relationship with the agency, um, it can go south really quickly. So VR got $500,000 of money that has historically gone to IPSC programs to support programmatic funding and scholarships. Next slide. Well, VR stopped talking to us. And when they were at a meeting um, and we were asking questions about the funding, um, it became a little hostile and the relationship had definitely gone south. Um, and they were trying to pull the plug also on providing tuition, fees, all the things that they were providing and pulling the plug on the transition um, teachers. And so everything we had worked so hard to do um, when this leadership change happened was about to go south. So we created um, a campaign. <laughs> We worked together um, with our colleagues at our DD Council and we, um, VR has to put things out for public comment when they make changes. And so they had put out for public comment that they were gonna change how they supported IPSC. Um, and they thought they could just kind of push it through and not have any um, adverse comments, um, which was not the case. So we put together this beautiful campaign to support IPSE and called it Stronger Together. Um, and we did written public comment, public testimony by, um, I made testimony, others made testimony. We had one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. We had a social media campaign and there were also um, legislative um, officials brought in to, um, to the mix to have some conversations about. Um, so this was kind of the real push um, that I needed to really step into action to, to support our programs on a, on a much higher level. All right, next, next slide. So we put out a public statement um, as the consortium about inclusive post-secondary education. Um, 
you know, how important our relationship with VR had been. We were very careful in this language that we used. Um, and, you know, we strongly requested that VR support continued access for every student in Georgia. And then there's a, a contention nationally um, on how to support IPSE through WIOA. Um, and think colleges put out um, with colleagues, you know, a whole written statement about the policy tangle. Um, but we really do believe that WIOA supports students going to these programs. So we put all this in a public statement um, and a bunch of people attended probably five different public comment sessions. Next. We got to keep the VR policy. So um, it was a major win. Um, they were really caught off guard that we actually pushed back against the change. So. Um, the VR policy got to, to stay for the time being. Next slide. We did lose our teachers though. Um, so VR decided to absorb the teachers into their rank and file and work in the, the big office. Um, there were some, there was an RSA visit and RSA um, is the rehab, wait, Russ, you can probably say what RSA is better than me. Rehabilitation Services Administration. And they, um, every state um, is audited and visited by RSA. Um, and RSA said we were double dipping in funds by having teachers and paying tuition and fees. Um, Cause their VR did not do the best job of showing the difference in what they were providing and accounting. And um, there's just a whole lot of um, confusion um, around. And this is all still why we have, while we have people in leadership that did not support IPSC. So we lost the teachers, but we were able to get the $500,000 given back to the Georgia Council. So we um, had colleagues who had control of the funding who would distribute it the way that the legislature intended. And that was the problem with VR is that they didn't distribute the funding as the legislature intended. And so um, they used it to, help pay for tuition and fees and all those kinds of things, um, which was not the intent, so. Susanna, do you mind if I jump in really quick with yeah. just a, a quick comment on, on that? And, 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 and that's, you know, when we talk about partnerships between inclusive post-secondary programs and, and uh, VR, I think this slide right here can really show the, the value of having those kind of partnerships in place because if you if you heard what Susanna was just saying, both sides really learned something as it relates to that um, monitoring visit from RSA. It was unfortunate that those teachers you know were, were lost, but they learned something through that process. Now it, you know if it had been lined up and, and maybe outlined or they'd been in place in a little bit different kind of a way or set up in a little bit different kind of way, that may not have happened. I don't know. I don't know the details enough to know the answer to that. But VR also learned something about how they have to use that money when that money is provided to them. And especially when you're using money for match and, and some of those kinds of things. So that that's, you know, I just wanted to highlight that piece of it because while there was maybe some changes that were not ideal from each perspective independently, they were there was an ability to come together around those things, learn from those lessons. Maybe they were, uh, you know, um, pain points in all of this as well, but the pain points didn't destroy what had happened. It, prov it was able to be worked through. And I, I would say, uh, because I've been, you know, uh, part of this for you know a lot of these times and, and was consulted with on some of these um, points that we're talking about here. It ended up being a good thing, even though there were some pain points and losses on both sides. And I just wanted to highlight that if that's okay, Susanna. Yeah, no, we all learned a lot and Russ and I became closer for it. <laughs> all right, next slide. So in 2018, um, it was determined that we needed to create a director team. So we named this the director team um, because it was the directors of all the organizations that had financial vested interest in IPSC. So in 2018, um, the CLD where I work, um, we had a TIPSID grant 
to um, grow our consortium. So we were giving schools money. The Georgia Council on Developmental Disabilities was giving schools money. Um, the Department of Ed had given money, um, as we saw just a second ago, that kind of got wonky. And then um, VR. And we realized at that point, we'd, are, we'd had informal connections with everyone um, because we'd all been working together a very long time. And we thought that those connections and those um, spur of the moment meetings would help manage everything. But we learned that we needed a more formal group, especially if we didn't have as close relationships with the administration at VR as we had previously. And so we have a um, biannual meeting um, and then an as needed if we need to meet more with the director team to talk about financial responsibilities, sustainability, um, and other options within our state um, for anyone who you know, has an investment in these programs. So that has turned out really great. And also part of the director team is a representative from our Senate budget office, our state budget office, and our governor's budget office because we get state funding through the Georgia Council to do this. And so um, it's been nice to have the backing of the Senate and the House budget offices to really help move things forward, especially when we didn't have the best relationship with VR. Um, they could kind of be some of the heavies to help um, push an agenda forward or expectations forward for what the money was. So um, we continue to have this meeting today. Um, we just had it a couple of weeks ago when I um, we started this transition for me. So um, I think it's super important for the key financial players to, to meet regularly and be on the same page. Next slide. So as part of all of this too, um, it, it got really hairy for a while. And this is my former director, Dan Crimmins. Um, him, the VR director and our um, DD council director all got called to a house budget committee meeting to talk about IPSE, to talk about um, the contributions of VR to IPSE and holding VR accountable for funding. Um, so it, everyone kind of got called to the principal's office. Um, things came to a head. Um, and it was, a, it was a very interesting time for all of us. Um, so this is Dan um, presenting to that, that committee. Uh, next slide. Through all the craziness in 2019, um, and who knows why, but it was obvious that a lot of relationships were strained, not just with IPSE, um, that a new executive director of GVRA um, was appointed, and we got a new director of VR. Our new director of VR was back, um, she was around at the very beginning, and she helped create the support of um, KSU being a vendor. Um, and a VR provider. And so it was just really exciting to have um, a new director of VR who supported IPSE, who um, had been around from the beginning. She left Georgia to go get her PhD. Um, and then she came back to um, take over and support um, the work of VR in Georgia. So we were back to uh, having buddies around in, um, and she's still my friend today. Um, back at the, the state VR offices. Next slide. And then things changed again. Um, so when the new VR director who super supported the work that we were doing um, was charged with kind of sorting out this monitoring visit from RSA and kind of all the issues that had been brought up, especially internally with VR tracking things, um, they determined that the most lucrative way for VR to support IPSE programs that was above board, non-questionable, um, was for all the IPSE programs to become VR providers um, and to be paid to provide VR services, including pre-employment transition services to eligible students. So 10 years later, we have circled back to where we started. So 
it truly has been a roller coaster um, ride. We've learned a lot of lessons. We have a lot of great examples. Um, you know, if there's more clear direction from the U.S. Department of Ed Office of Special Ed and Rehabilitation, um, I think some different strides could be made um, and we're poised to be able to, to take those on in Georgia because we've had every situation you can imagine. Um, through it all, I've always been an advocate for vocational rehabilitation and its services and how it can support our students. And I think it just takes some creativity, some very strong relationships and some tenacity. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Russ. Okay, and, and I've got, we've got this nice little transition slide here. Roller coasters aren't always bad, but sometimes they are. <clears throat> And, um, I, you know, I think the point around that is, you know, I, I think from a perspective of partnershiping between um, IPSC programs and VR, Georgia is a really good example and it's a good story to hear, especially the way that Susanna has shared it because they've been through it and, uh, and you know, so many of those ups and downs and the, the waxing and the waning of relationships but it's still there and it's there's still tendrils there to be built upon. And each time, hopefully, you know, the hope is, is that it gets a little bit better and a little bit better. There are some places where some clarity could be very, very helpful. It would be really great if the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services or the Rehabilitation Services Administration, the Department of Education in general, if, if there were more guidance that was specific to this that helps provide that roadmap a little clearer. Now, here in a minute, I'm going to share some of those documents with you. But even with you know, some guidance and some direction, agencies are still kind of finding their way in terms of these relationships. So, you know, I, I think if you anticipate the roller coaster ride, then you're going to be prepared for it and you can enjoy the thrill of it. But also notice that there are those points where you might be the faces on those folks that right there, that second row back, um, where it's like, what the heck are we, have we gotten ourselves into? But it can, it can work very, very well. I'm going to step back a little bit. Um, Susanna has been talking to you about George's particular experience. I'm going to give you a, maybe a little bit more of a 5,000 foot elevation perspective from someone who does a lot of technical assistance with programs and VR agencies around these relationships and how they work. And, I, and so I'm gonna share some things that I've learned in working with a, a variety of different states um, that I think are those key elements for these relationships to happen. And they're those fundamentals on which you can build so many of the nuances that you need to, that are unique for your particular situation. And by the way, um, I, I'm kind of keeping an eye on the chat. If any of you have questions on and anything here, put them in the chat. We'll chat. We'll um, pause when they come up and try to answer them so that we're dealing with them when they're within the context of what we're talking about. I'm also going to try to wrap up so we have some time for questions and discussion at the end. So in terms of awesome partnerships, I think the essential element of this is relationships. If you don't have a relationship at some level, if you're not starting with building a relationship at some level, it's really, really hard to get to that partnership level. You know, um, I, I'm not gonna get into a lot of the details. Some of you in other venues may have heard me talk about this, but when you take a look at trust in partnerships at whatever level, whether it's a marriage relationship, if it's a business relationship, if it's a, you know, or an organizational relationship, um, the most, the essential part of having trust in those partnerships are, is relationships, that ability to relate to one another. And I, and so I, I share that because every, every instance where I'm asked to, to come and be a help in facilitating the development of partnerships and relationships between programs, VR programs and college programs, is you've got to find that area where you're going to relate. What's the, what's one thing at least that can start to change everything 
not necessarily in how everything is delivered, but what can change everything in terms of your ability to relate further and talk further. And so when, when you start building these partnerships and the best place to start with those is to just have a conversation. We have a program, we'd like to share some information with you, but we wanna hear your thoughts. What are, the, what are the things that are you're hearing or what are your perceptions? What are the concerns that you have? And really having that meaningful didactic relationship building conversation that starts to build or, or create that little spark of trust so that you can continue those conversations. From my experience, that's the best and singular place to start is just have talk, have communications, find something that is going to change everything to move it from where you are to that next particular level. The next part of this is alignment. <clears throat> Once you've gotten that, even if it's just foundational relationship, what are the areas that you can find that align, that are common in purpose for what you're trying to do, whether you're the VR agency or you're an IPSC, and the other partner being VR or IPSC? One of the things that bothered me the most as a VR counselor and also when I was an agency director, and, and not, I'm not talking specifically with IPSC, but it, IPSC programs are included in that, is when people came to me as a VR counselor or came to our program, basically from the standpoint of, we want some of your money. You know, you've got funds, you're doing this, we want, we want some of it. And so the, the entryway into our communications was, there was an ask of us. And it was, that ask was, what are you going to give me? What's, you know, we want our cut from the resources that you have. Not too often did I hear someone come in and say, you know what I want? I want to just understand your program and what you're doing for people with disabilities. And in particular, people, you know, individuals with intellectual disabilities to help them get into careers. And let's talk about maybe a way that we can find some common intersections there to talk about that and see where that goes. So it's the ask is simple. Let's find if there's some alignment, if there's some common purpose there. Are there some things that we can work on? Um, and so my, my thought is once you start getting that spark of trust in place and you're building that relationship, don't run faster than you're ready. Don't go in with a bunch of asks. We want you to do this. We want you to do that. But go in and say, what we want is we want to hear what you're thinking. We want to know what your questions of us are. We would like to answer those questions either now or we'll go back and get information and bring it back to you. What do we want? We want to just continue this dialogue till we can find something meaningful that maybe we can build ourselves around and, and save some of those other pieces for when that trust and that relationship are a little bit stronger. Part of that alignment to me is understanding that, you know, VR is, you know, vocational rehabilitation has its purpose in helping people get to work, but they also have a responsibility to do what's right by those individuals that they're serving, including giving counseling and guidance to them. It is not necessarily the responsibility of vocational rehabilitation to support IPSC programs. That's not the role of VR is to keep the programs going. What its role is, is for those individuals for whom those programs make sense, that's a support that VR can and should provide. Now, that's not to say that, you know, VR shouldn't, you know, because the other side of that is, is VR often is taking the stance of, we don't do that. We just, we don't, we don't provide funding for that avenue. And that's, that's erroneous on their part and the part of the VR agency. And it's in, it's in those, it's in that space there and those elements that I find that I spend most of my time. So, but if we start with trust and then finding those points of alignment, 
And when we talk about those points of alignment, you know, what are ways that, you know, educate and inform and provide information and, and, and share data and information around how we can help VR meet its purpose? Because its purpose is competitive integrated employment in career oriented work. And if you can say, look, if that's if that's what you're trying to do, here's what we can do to help you get folks into that competitive, integrated, career oriented um, employment settings that has a trajectory that has a pathway to it. And if you can start to share that, then that becomes a, a greater interest to those VR programs. I'm checking for questions, none at this point. And then, as I said before, communicate, talk, 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 talk. You can't, especially when you're at that relationship building stage, that partnership establishment stage, talk, talk, go back and get more information if you need to. Come back together and keep talking. See what you can find again. That What's that one thing you can find, that, that incremental change that is going to start to change everything going forward? As I mentioned earlier, don't start with an ask except for to continue to dialogue and listen to each other. Next, use your tools. As you start to build that rapport and you get that relationship, you've got a plethora of information to help you guide that relationship in a meaningful way. Share it in a facilitative partnership way and say, you know, here's some things that we've got that might be a, of information to you. Would you. We'd like to talk through them, give you a chance to look over them. If you're not ready to talk about them now, let's get back together and talk about them. But let these tools be a resource to help inform the process for you. And I want to talk about just a few of what those are. Um, I'm not going to be able to go into them in depth, but um, I can share this PowerPoint um, with Julie to make sure that it gets out to all of you because there are links for all of these resources built within these. One of the tools you have is a lot of information. There's research that's been done on the positive impact of post-secondary education on employment outcomes for individuals with intellectual disability. They're twice more, uh, they're more than two times as likely to be employed. They have higher earnings when they get work and they require $77 less per month in SSI than counterparts who went through a VR program but did not receive post-secondary education. Um, this is a, uh, this is a uh, article that was done by Frank Smith and, and others around what is the impact of inclusive post-secondary education for people with intellectual disabilities who went through the vocational rehabilitation program. And I've just highlighted a few of the followings. If I'm a VR program, especially with the new common measures under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, if I can see that there's two times um, the likelihood of them being employed with higher earnings, that's gonna get my attention. Here's another one. This one's a little bit state specific. It's related specifically to uh, California. But individuals in California served through the VR system who had intellectual disability, they took a look at their weekly earnings at case closure, uh, those who had post-secondary education compared to those who did not go through a post-secondary education experience. And look at the difference in weekly earnings. Okay, for those that did not go through and complete a program, it was about $200 a week. You're talking over 300, maybe closer to $350 a week in weekly earnings for those who did go through a post-secondary um, education program. Again, this is information that speaks to VR and some information that you might want to share. Fast facts are a great resource and there's a bunch of those within the Think College website. I'm singling one out here that talks about the impact of post-secondary education. And it talks about how youth with intellectual disabilities who receive post-secondary education services as part of their IPE made gains in edu educational attainment. Uh, they were 14% more likely to exit with paid integrated employment and had 51% higher wages than those, did, the, those who got VR but didn't go through an inclusive post-secondary education. 
And so these, these kinds of things, I think, VR doesn't always think about these. They don't have access to this data. They're not searching it out, but you can bring that to them and help inform and use that to, to germinate the dialogue in the direction that you want to go. One particular point here that I think is very important is how you use this information. All of this is information that can be used as a building block or it can be weaponized. And you want to make sure that you're using it in a relation in a way that the relationship is being fostered rather than damaged. If you go in and you're saying, look, you should be funding us because 51, you know, people who go through our program are 51% are going to get 51% higher wages. So what's your problem? And now we may not see it that directly, but we can still message that. But if you build the rapport, if you build the trust and you have the dialogue and you understand that they're not necessarily in the role of making sure that every student or every client that they serve with intellectual disability is going to want, is going to need, or that they're going to support them in inclusive post-secondary education, you're gonna be able to find that dialogue and find that niche where it's going to work for those students for whom it makes sense. So caution there, don't weaponize this information. Let's take a look at actual employment outcomes from um, TIPSID programs. 52% of them had a paid job as they exited their programs. 64% of them had a paid job one year and 72% had a paid job two years after they exited. And so, you know, the, the, the employment goes up and down a little bit, but that's, those are some pretty impressive um, employment statistics for a population um, that typically is one of the more disadvantaged and we find has the greatest struggle in finding employment outcome. Well, I think I, that's data that we can use. For the national average is between 17 and 19 percent. And so that's yeah. a striking number. I just had to point that out. No, no, you're right. Uh, and, and thank you for pointing out those numbers because um, that, that's significant. And I think that that's, that can speak to a VR agency. But they don't always have this information. They don't know what's coming out of the tips. It's, it's not intuitive for them to go and look at it, but you can inform and you can educate them. This slide here has um, a, a bunch of different links. And these are links that will be important to make sure that you have. Um, let me just touch on them really quickly. The first one is a, um, a, a guidance document that came out in August of 2020 from then Commissioner Mark Schultz and Laurie Vanderplot from the um, OSEP, Office of Special Education. And it talked about the importance of collaboration between special ed programs and VR as it relates to post-secondary education. And, and, and so there is a, it references this transition guide to post-secondary education employment, which is the second bullet point link that you see there. That's that transition guide that is very, very helpful and can be informative. These are all available. They've been shared with and they've been notified to VR, but in the, in the busy world of what they're doing, they maybe haven't really digested this. So you can provide the opportunity for them to do that, have that digestive conversation around these types of things. Um, the third bullet point is a question and answer document that was issued by the Department of Education, and it's got a bunch of appendices attached to it on post-secondary education institutions, including CTPs and post-secondary education um, programs for students with intellectual disabilities. And that can be a really great resource for you. The fourth one is not necessarily coming from education or RSA or whatever. It's actually coming from the National Governors Association. And, and the, the reason I wanted to put this in here, I was reading this at one point and I wasn't even think, I wasn't even in the Think College frame of mind when I was reading it, but I read something in this link here and it's in the executive summary. So you don't even need to go past the executive summary if you pull up this publication by the NRA uh, or the NGA, excuse me, the NGA. Basically, it said that, that when you look at um, the from 2007 through 2017, and I know we're getting a little dated here, but um, that's when this study was done. It said that the opportunities for those with a high school education or less 
had a net loss of 5.5 million jobs across the United States. So if you had a high school education from 2007 to 2017, your job opportunities nationally shrunk by five and a half million, five and a half million. However, for that same decade of time, for individuals who had at least some post-secondary education, there was a 11.5 to almost 11.6 million dollar or 11.6 jobs created in the United States at that time. And so does post-secondary education have vocational and employment implications? It does, because if you have even just some, you are going to be able to tap into a growth of jobs that's over 11 million in a decade compared to a loss of five and a half if you don't have post-secondary education. That speaks to vocational rehabilitation. All right, I've got to hurry. I'm going to be really quick. Um, I want to share with you just a couple of states. You've heard about Georgia. Let me tell you just a little bit about Oklahoma. Oklahoma is a state that was, um, they weren't doing inclusive post-secondary education. There wasn't support from that. It wasn't necessarily a hard, fast no, although I'm sure that that message was shared. But from the state perspective, they just weren't doing it. And as a result of some communications and being able to, uh, they, they actually reached out to me and I was able to bring the programs and the leadership of the agency together for a conversation. When we talk about relationships, if you don't have the relationship, go to someone who has that. The Oklahoma program, I was able, I knew some of those program folks because of my work at Think College. They said, hey, Russ, do you mind joining a call that we're going to have with Oklahoma? Because you know that leadership as well. I was the relationship with, with them and was on that call. We were able to talk through some of the concerns that they had. We were able to meet multiple times. I actually made the suggestion, hey, you know, here's a way to think about getting your feet wet in supporting this program and not maybe jumping more than you're really ready to. What if you did a pilot? What if you piloted X number of students or you piloted X number of dollars per student and, and gave it a shot? See what happens. And they did. And they were going to go two years and then study where they felt things were in two years. Well, we're still within that two year window of of time. And not only have they gone beyond that pilot, they've expanded the pilot to more than the area that they had. They brought in another university. And even still within that two-year initial window of pilot, they're now making the effort to take this program statewide because of what they're seeing in the impact that it's having. One more quick one, then I'm going to wrap up so we have some time to talk. Um, Let's, uh, let, let's, talk about, let's talk about Minnesota. Minnesota's very ground level um, approach where advocates, parents, um, advocacy groups wanted to go beyond where isolated counselors were supporting inclusive post-secondary education. But across the state at the statewide agency level, there was really nothing there by way of policy, which basically meant there was all sorts of policies. You had people in one part of the state saying, no, we don't do that. You had people in other parts of the state saying, yeah, we can do that. And we have done it and we do do it. And so that parent advocacy group got together and or, well, actually they, they contacted me. And one of the things I said, and here's a pitch for Susanna's new, new role and position and for, for MIPSA, I said, create a coalition create an alliance, get people together and invite VR to the table. Don't create it and then go at VR, create the alliance and bring them in as a partner and share what you're trying to do. And if you need to have a call, bring me on board and I'll, I'll meet with them. We had a couple of conversations. Now, this is still a developing alliance. It's still a developing piece. And Minnesota is supporting inclusive post-secondary education, but not at the level statewide that they want to be at and that the Alliance doesn't want, wants them to be at. And so they're working on it. But if there's ever, a, if there's an example of uh, outside of what Georgia did as it relates to having an Alliance, having a coalition, bringing people together and building it with all the stakeholders at the table, Minnesota is a really good example. 
because what's happening here is VR doesn't feel like they're being come at. They're at the table and they're part of the development of this and they're adjusting their culture and their policies and their changes as this grows and comes on board. But if you think about it, in both of those examples, it starts with relationship, it starts with communication, you share information, and then you build on it on those fine, those things that you find in common between yourself. Okay. Any questions? We've been feeding you with the fire hose, I think. Let's pause. I have a question. I, uh, my name is Sean Jackson. I'm the admissions and transition coordinator. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. I'm the admissions and transition coordinator for the Horizon School in Birmingham, Alabama. And we are kind of a unique school where we serve, we're a transition college and career readiness school with an independent living component to enhance your success by the time they're working or in college. Um, and we transition them into those settings. Um, we serve all of the United States because of our res residential component. And we are partners. We've had to develop relationships and partner with states outside of Alabama for students who come from other states. And it's been very difficult. The challenge I've had is what I don't know if what, what you guys have been talking about has been related to in-state services and, and schools and education and things like that or whether or not uh, it applies to schools who may be outside the state, still being supported by an outside state, uh, st a student being supported by the state they're from, such as Georgia, Tennessee, Florida. Right now we are, we, we worked really hard to become an approved, approved provider uh, from Georgia, Tennessee, and Florida. And we were an Alabama provider, but we're kind of developing that relationship again or rebuilding that relationship. Um, I guess the question is, is that uh, it's really difficult to develop and build a relationship with these uh, different states because they want everything to stay within the state itself. Um, how would I, how do I improve relationships in order to, for them to know that this is this is a really beneficial experiential program where our inclusivity is based on community classes, our classes are non-traditional, non-academic. And so the inclusion that happens is that the classes are out in the community. Um, they're learning fitness in a, at a real fitness center. Uh, they're learning to shop because the classes take place at a grocery store, things like that, and transportation. Um, how do we get other states to see us as a value to the students that are coming from their state? And, and supporting them to come to our school as a real option for the students? That, that's a really good question, Sean. And, and it's, a, it's a really long answer. And so let me try to do it really quick. And then you've got mine and Susanna's email there. Um, yeah. Shoot me an email and we can even talk offline to go into more detail than we have time for right now. But in reality, the states, because, because federal dollars are, are offered to states, and states need to match with state dollars to draw down that federal dollars. There is, there is that latitude that agencies have to have their services and their state dollars used within their state. It, it's, that doesn't mean, however, that they're prohibited from spending those dollars elsewhere. By the same token, by taking those, you know, by taking, by, by drawing down those federal dollars, they agree to adhere to the federal regulations and the laws that, that are attached to that. And, and states cannot hold it within. So there are other places that, that you know, those dollars can be spent. But the main thing that what you're going to want to do, and this, this is maybe the conversation we have a, a deeper discussion around, is what is it about your program that is uniquely different in getting individuals to an employment outcome that those states are going to want to fund outside of that? What, what is it that you're offering that is not being offered within the state that's going to make an employment impact for those individuals and maximize that and communicate those as you're building those relationships? I appreciate that, that. Yeah, absolutely. And you're exactly right because that has been, they're like, well, we have competitive, we, uh, comparable services here. But what we find out is it's not exactly the 
accurate answer. Um, so we work with the families to also have the families have a big voice in that conversation, things like that. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And, and I think you bring up a really good point, too. As a program, you don't want to get into the battle with VR about mm -hmm. them funding IPSC. Let make sure that as a program, you're informing students, students, parents, and other advocates of their due process rights so that the, the those battle areas, if people don't agree with the decisions that VR is making, is being done through the appropriate channels. If you're trying to build a relationship with VR, you don't at the same time want to be attacking them through a due process. Exactly. But it, but it is certainly within your right to inform your students of what their due process right with VR is. And let that process run its course while you continue to be an informational, be partnering and to build the relationship so that when they're ready, you're, you're at the table. That's happening in a state I'm working with right now. They're actually looking very intently at, ex, at getting inclusive post-secondary programs, fund, you know, funding these programs in their state. And it all started because of a fair hearing. Okay. But the fair hearing went through the client and their advocates, not the program. And so what's happening is now, now we want to start talking with the programs because We've had a fair hearing finding that's telling us we can't do what we're doing, and so we need to start doing. And I think you you bring up a good point too. I think one of the, our strengths has also been sometimes those pro like when, for Georgia, for, for example, um, there's such a, a long waiting list for some of the programs they offer through VR um, that they're now looking at us and they're developing. They're kind of revisiting how we can then serve the student. Um, that may not be getting the services there um, and things like that. So yeah. I appreciate that. And I will reach out to you guys and talk a little bit more about it because I really, truly appreciate that guidance. Um, Great. Glad, glad to have helped a little bit. Um, Julie, I know we're at time. Um, we probably need to wrap up, but by all means, connect with us via email. Um, Julie, I'll send you this PowerPoint and we can go um, you know, wherever we need to. Dana, hi, Dana. What are some different funding models? Maybe this is a next iteration. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good conversation to have. And maybe we can bring that up, Dana, at, an, at another um, one of these calls or some other kind of a forum. Yeah, it's a good question. Thanks, Unfortunately, Rob. we don't have time for it. No, I know. It's good to hear your voice and see your name. You guys were just awesome. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Be well. Take care, thank everyone. You. Russ, I think your advice was just so great. Oh, good, good. I mean, it really, you, 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 you.